where I'm hovering the pointer at the moment, you can see a row of buttons, radio buttons. Um, and so far, we've only been looking at two kilometer scale maps. If I click on the 10 km, surprise, surprise, you get a 10 kilometer scale map. I'll go to something a bit more common. Um, Oh. Baker. <laughs> One marbled carpet, for example. Mm. And let's go back to looking at all of the all of the years recorded. So the two kilometer scale map looks pretty good for that species. The 10 kilometer scale map is practically solid. Now you can see at a glance, we've got one 10K square that is almost entirely within our county, but it doesn't have any records for the species. So um, will someone please record it there? Um, now here we have a, an example of a species for which there is a comment which doesn't relate to a historical record it relates to the difficulty of identification. Um, so it points you to use the hindwing underside to tell it apart from dark marbled carpet, which is a fairly similar looking species from the upper side, but somewhat different shaped markings on the underside. Anyway, that's a little diversion. Let's look at what else we got. Two kilometers, 10 kilometers, number of years. Number of years. Now we can see how many years this species has been recorded in, in each of the tetrads. Now this is the number of years since 1990. Um, I ignored all of the older years in the database and started counting at 1990 and then color coded it and by size of dot. So we've got one to five is a tiny dot in one of the four colors. Then six to 10 is a bar in one of the four colors and a larger square is, well, 11 to 12, 13 to 15, 16 to 19, 20 to 24, or if it's red, 25 or more. And there's only, oh, I think there's only three um, tetrads where it's been recorded in 25 or more years, recorded and mapped. And um, I think of the people we know, the only one of those is Roger Gaunt. Mm. And then someone in Gloucester has recorded it, or maybe two different people in Gloucester, but their combined set of records cover more than 25 or more years. And then um, that might be someone from Bishop's Cleave or from the outskirts of Bishop's Cleave. Um, if I change the period of, rec of map record shown, which, I've, which I'm changing the period shown and that's not affecting this map at all. If I go to the fourth option on that row period, now you can see the number of records by third of a month for each year since 1990 again. Um, and just to make it easier to see which year is which, I've every three years I've drawn a, a line across. So you can use this um, labeling on the right hand side to see the year. So um, if we look at the total number of records for the year, only three records in 1990, number of records gradually increases and after 2011-2012 it jumps quite significantly um, and then since then it rises steadily as well. There are two different reasons for this. One is because more people are now recording. 
But the other reason is that until the 2011 season, the county recorder was Roger Gaunt. And I can't remember if he also started um, doing the recording in 2012. And what he used to do is because he was entering the records from the whole of the county and it was slower using a computer in those days, he saved himself some time by for each species, for each person who recorded from their home trap, he would only enter one record for that species for the year, um, whichever um, date had the highest total. So the total number of records for a species um, for a home trap would just be one for each person's home trap, rather than maybe a dozen or more for the number of times they trapped during the flight season of the common marble carpet. I mean, if they trapped throughout its entire flight period, as you can see, it's almost continuous from the start of May to the end of October, um, with a few stragglers maybe till after the, after the start of July and before the end of August. So maybe there's a five week period when you'd hardly get any, but there's five or six weeks when you get a lot and there's about seven weeks when you get a lot. So if you trapped every week or more than once a week, you would end, in, you would end up by sending in a lot of records of this species. And back in Roger's day, for a lot of people, he would only actually enter one record for the species. But since other people took over from Roger, they enter all of the records, A, because it's the right thing to do, and B, because it's actually easier to do when people send them the records in a form that's easy for them to load into their database. So it would actually take time to pick out the best records. Um, so anyway, that's why the number of records towards the top of this, this chart um, escalates massively. Um, and the color coding here is, you can see it's all in multiples of two. Um, so um, from one to two, through up to 27 to 28, and then 29 or more. Um, that seems to work quite well, but I could change the multiple to three if, if that worked better, or four or whatever. Right. Um, so here we have a flight chart above the map. Let's go back to looking at um, where the species has been recorded. Um, this row below this choice of four types of map, you've got two different things here, the altitude chart tick box. What happens if we tick that? Wow. What we've got here now, instead of the time of year, we've got the altitude in meters. And we've got the number of records where the grid reference to 100 meters is given so that I can use the data that is known for the height of each 100 meter square um, to say what the altitude of that record was. And so I can plot a, a chart of the number of records by altitude. So that's what these black bars show. So what are the pale gray background? Well, that's the, um, that's the number of tetrads at that altitude in the county, or the proportion of the county that's at that altitude. Sorry, not the number of tetrads, the number of um, hectares, the number of six figure grid references at that altitude in the county. So 0 to 24, 25 plus, 50 plus, and so on. And there are just a few above 300 meters. I think there's actually a few above 325, but I've lumped all of the 300 meter plus together. 
Um, and as you'll see on the map, um, the high ground is actually shaded. And that's what this box here is all about. And again, this is one of those boxes where if I click on it, I see lots of different options and you, you don't see them at all on the Zoom sharing. So um, I will describe what I'm seeing now, which is a box where the top row says none, the next row says 25 plus meters, the next row says 50 plus meters, 75 plus, et cetera, et cetera, down to 300 plus. The next row says each 50 meters, and the final row says each 100 meters. And as you can see from the setting that you can see, it says each 50 meters. And looking at the map, some of the land is shaded pale, some of it is shaded a bit darker, some of it darker again, and so it goes on. And that shading gets darker as you go up 50 meters in altitude. So now I'll go to none. And as you will have seen, the whole, the whole map for our recording area has gone white. And now I will use the mouse wheel to go slowly through the options. And you'll see the, the ground at that altitude and above shaded. So I'll go to 25 plus. So now you'll know that if you live in the area that's white, you need to worry about global warming. Now 50 plus, 75 plus and so on. So I'll keep going higher and higher and higher and the shaded area gets smaller and smaller and smaller. 275, hardly anything showing, mainly just in the Cotswolds. Tiny bit in the Dean still. So this bit I think is at um, Wigpool in the Dean. Um, and various bits in the Cotswolds are shown. But if I go now to 300 plus, there's only a tiny bit in the Cotswolds showing. And now I'll go back to the original 50 plus and finally 100 plus. So that's shading 100, 200, and it hardly shows at all, but 300. Um, for some species, their distribution is actually very much linked to altitude for one reason or another. So if I go to Stigmella aceris, and click on the right box. So here we have a leaf mining species on field maple. Nearly all of its records in the county are from the Seven Vale. Um, a few records are at a greater altitude, and it has been recorded in, in a few places in, in the Cotswolds, but the vast majority are in, in the Seven Vale. So that shows up both on this chart above the map. So you can see the, the um, heights of the black bars aren't shaped anything like the heights for the pale gray background. And on the map, Yes, um, the each, each 100 meters showing is, um, it is being recorded at some land over 100 meters. So if, if I shade only at above 200 meters, yes, the odd record is at that kind of height, but nearly everything is, is below that. Um, that's an example of a species for which the distribution is, is very much low altitude, or it is at the moment. Um, click on clear, click on Loewen, part of the name of Pancalia Loewen, Loewen Hercula. Um, Van Loewenhoek was um, an ancient um, 
entomologist and, and all round naturalist who I believe was involved with the um, early days of compound microscopy. I think he may have even invented some of the uh, technology. And a number of species are named after him and, and this is one of them, obviously. But as you can see, this is a species whose food plants, typical foods are hairy violet and dog violet. Well, dog violet you get in woodland, but in the Cotswolds, this species is very much linked to grasslands where hairy violet grows. And if I go back to the um, each 50 meters shading, um, all of the records are, are from the area where you would expect to find Cotswold grasslands, unimproved grasslands. Um, and that's where this species occurs. A very few common species are found everywhere at such density that their altitude map looks something like the proportion of land at the different um, heights. Um, silver Y, perhaps. Yeah, that's not a bad match. Right. Now, something else I wanted to show is comparing the maps for different species. All of the time I've been changing maps, this block of, and you should be seeing, yes, seven click buttons here with names of species on them. Um, when you first load the, um, the page, um, what it'll say there is species density map in each of those. But then as you change species, um, the current species is the top one. As I scroll through. And the previous eight species, uh, previous six species are, are the six dots below. Um, this is actually a quite a recent change to six. Um, it was five until earlier today, but um, you'll see the reason for that in a minute. Now, if you wanted to compare the maps for three different species, say species that are found in the same habitat, to see if there's any, any significant looking difference for them. Um, let's choose um, Burnet Companion and Mother Shipton and Common Heath. These are all species you would expect to find on Cotswold grasslands. So um, Burnet C, Burnet Companion. Um, I, after typing in part of its name, I actually hit the enter key. You don't have to click on find matches. So that's the map for that one. And because there was only one match, the, the, box em, uh, the box went empty. So I can actually type the next name, Mother Shipton. Go R ship, there is only the one match, Mother Shipton. And now I'll enter, well, there's a lot of common moths and there's a lot of heath moths. So I'll actually have to say, um, I think that should get it for me. Yes, it does. So now down here we have Common Heath, Mother Shipton, Burnet Companion in these three buttons here. And those are the species I want to compare. So what happens if I click on Burnet Companion? Its map has appeared. And the top button has changed to Burnet Companion and Common Heath and Mother Shipton have both shifted down by one. So now if I click on Mother Shipton, that map appears and now Common Heath has appeared there and the other two have shifted down by one. And, and so it goes on. So to compare three species, I just keep clicking on the third button and you can see whether you think these species have significantly dif different distributions. And it's obvious that Burnet Companion is recorded in the urban surround of, of Bristol and far more widely than 
the other two species, but in particular, common heath seems to be more restricted than the other two. Now, um, until recently, I had another web page that had the previous two species shown at half size off to the right. And it also had some other functionality on it, um, which I recently discovered wasn't working very well anyway. So I did away with that page and um, I moved the half size maps onto this page as an option. Um, the reason that's an option is because you might not want to have this window wide enough to see the other maps at half size because of what you're doing on your screen at the time. Um, and so you might only want to have a narrow bit of screen showing, showing these maps. Fair enough. But if you if you do have a bit more space available, you can show the maps of the previous two species at half size. And that's what this bar on the right says. Um, so as of hmm, yesterday or today, that, that bar has appeared and, and, and has the text on it saying previous species at half size. So if I click on that, I get the previous two species at half size. Um, so now we can look at Common Heath, Mother Shipton and Burnett Companion simultaneously. Um, and as you'll see, the maps look fairly similar. They haven't got all of the same textual detail on them, but basically they're the same. You've got the same chart at the top. You've got the same altitude display on the map. You've got the same dot display. So if I change any of those, I'll change through the types of years shown, and you'll see those changing on the small maps as well. I'll change um, the type of map, 10K or 2K. If I change it to either of the other two options, it won't show anything because it's only showing distribution maps. But um, fair enough. If I change the chart, it changes it back to the year chart. And if I change the type of altitude display, well, it changes that as well. And um, if you look to the right, you'll see we've got two buttons to the right. One is pointing to the left and one is pointing to the right. Well, the one pointing to the left um, does what you would expect. It would close that again. Actually, if you, if you click anywhere over these half size maps or on that area, it closes that area. So it's closed it. I'll click on that to open it again. Um, if I go to the black bit in the middle between those two buttons, and if I click there, I don't think anything should happen. And it doesn't. If I move slightly to the right and click that, well, now we have four half size maps showing the previous four species, which on the display as we've got it at the moment, as well as Mother Shipton and Burnett Companion, we've picked up Sycamore and Grey Dagger. Well, you'll see we've still got two buttons to the right and we've got two more buttons here. And if we click on the right hand button, we now get two more half size maps. And because my window isn't very wide, it's not actually showing the um, the bit between the full size maps and the half size maps, it's no longer showing it properly. Um, that is a problem which will be fixed the next time I upload a change, because I've got something that fixes it. But in the meantime, I'll just widen my screen to fix that problem. Right. Um, 
Now, as far as I can see, that problem is fixed on my screen, but whether it is fixed on yours, I do not know. Steve, what are yeah. you seeing? Yeah, that looks good, Guy. I can see right across the screen now. Yeah, you can see right. six maps clearly. Okay. Well, if I if I click anywhere now, it just closes all, all six maps. So I'll close it again. I'll open it to two. I'll open it to four. If I click anywhere other than on the very right hand side, it closes all, all four. So um, what haven't I done yet? Well, I haven't explained this in line yet. Not, but in at least one adjacent squares. What's that all about? Oh. Ah, excuse me while I have another drink. I haven't talked so much continuously for a very long time. And it's actually Yes. Right. OK. Um, what you might want to do is think, what should I be looking for in my home square? Um, are there any species, are there any common species which have been recorded in my area and which I haven't recorded yet? Um, so let's say I'll set the number here to three. So I want to see species which haven't been recorded in the square I'm interested in, but have been recorded in at least three adjacent squares. And I'm interested in records for all years still. I'll go to my favorite place, Rough Bank. So what hasn't been recorded at Rough Bank yet, but has been recorded in at least three adjacent squares. Well, already if I hover the cursor over this, it's telling me um, short winged plume hasn't been recorded there yet and swallow prominent hasn't been recorded there yet. Well, I know very well that short winged plume hasn't because that's a national rarity and I've been deliberately looking for it there for years. I click on the left mouse button. There is its map. As you can see, that one has been recorded in three adjacent squares. Um, and um, it hasn't been recorded at Rough Bank yet. We've got the food plant for it. Um, the next species downwards, well, there aren't any earlier species in the checklist. So if I click left again, I just get the density map. I click left again, I've wrapped around and I get the last species in the dense density map. Um, so I'm getting um, mottled rustic, click again, swallow prominent, click again, short winged plume. So there are only the three. Um, and so that, that tells me that I I can, I need to look out for those three species in that square. Um, for most squares, there would be quite a lot more species that have been recorded in, in adjacent squares and, and oh, somehow I, I accidentally changed that back to five. Oh no, uh, really scarce species three. Yes, three locally scarce species. Ah, oh, something not quite working. Right, okay. Yeah, I know what this problem is. If I was on a species. Yes, right. Okay, I've just discovered a bug that I knew there was a problem with this feature and I couldn't reproduce it deliberately, but I've just managed to reproduce it by accident. 
okay, there is something that needs to be fixed here. I will um, take a look at the code and see if I can fix it. So initially, um, when I cycled around the species, the three species, when I got to the species density map, it wasn't showing me what it is showing me now. Um, but now it is not showing me what happens on the mouse click when I put the cursor over there. Um, it should be doing that. It's a problem. I will fix it and move quickly on for the moment. Um, dum, 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 dum. So I'll get rid of that for the moment. Um, I'll just go to a species. Um, go to a common species, common heath. Right. Um, moving the cursor over this, and it's telling you about the number of um, adult records or not adult records. It's also telling you what happens if you do a control or shift click over this chart. It'll give you a species with the most records for that time of year. Or if you do a shift click left or if, sorry, if you do a left or right click, it'll give you the next or previous species in in order. That's in the order of the number of records at that time of year. Um, the left click. Ah, oh, the first species, right. Yes, no, that's right. So I'm doing left clicks and the total number of records for that period is increasing. Even if the height of the bar is jumping up and down, that's scaled differently for different species. If you look at the total number of records for late May, it's going up and up and up and up. 379, 385, 388, 390. If I press control or shift while clicking, it's gone to treble lines. 1,034 records for that period. Wow. Of which 996 were adult records and 38 were unspecified. If I do a left click, I don't get anything above that. If I do a right click and then keep doing a right click, the total number of records gets lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. So um, occasionally you'll have seen postings where Steve is putting the, the top 10 species recorded for a period. Well, um, maybe this is how he got them. Was it Steve? I got, no, it wasn't actually. I got it from the uh, moth species lists. Okay. That's a different web page that I haven't even mentioned yet. Yeah, that's for sure another day, I think. <laughs> that's for another day, yes. Right. What have I not covered? Um, well, you might you might have trouble working out your home tetrad on the map, have difficulty seeing where it is. Um, I've got something to help you with that. Um, let's say, for example, your home tetrad is somewhere near Stroud. Tetrad SO80i, where I'm hovering at the moment. Um, if I hold down the shift key and press on that, press left mouse click on that tetrad, instead of changing species, what's happened is that tetrad is now highlit. And that tetrad stays highlit. And if I look at the previous species at half size, the tetrad is highlit there. You can see that tetrad at a glance now. And um, that could be useful. If you get fed up with it, 
you can change it to somewhere else by clicking somewhere else on or off the map or if you click on the same one as it's currently showing that turns the lines off if you click in somewhere a long way off the map that doesn't have any stats um, nothing happens So um, one other thing I want to show you, and I'll shut up when I do this, I'm about to click on that same Tetrad again. And I'm instead of holding shift down, I will hold control down. And now you will get some voice output. So I'll go three, two, one, and then I will click. Three, two, one. Tetrad set to SO80I. Rosie Tabby, Endotrica Flaminis was last recorded in 2020. And if I move the cursor around slightly, you'll see the first and latest years for this species, 2016 and 2020. So yes. Um, did you hear my computer giving that information, Steve? I did, yeah. I just, uh, I just wondering who you got to record that for you. Robbie the robot, was that? Well, no, that's it. That is, um, that is something that the browser is doing. It's nothing. I've, I haven't selected the voice. Um, at different times, the voice has been female. Um, I think it's entirely random which voice the browser gives me. Um, I'm getting a woman at the moment. If I, change, <laughs> if I change species to Pyrosta purpuralis, for example, or oh no, I change it to um, flame carpet, it will tell me whether or not that was recorded, and if so, what the latest year was. Flame carpet was last recorded in 2019. So, um, after a while, you may get fed up with this. And if you scroll the mouse button to change species, you will get very fed up with it because it will do it for each species in turn, even the ones you didn't intend to look at. So I'll just quickly scroll it down by two or three. Silver ground carpet was last recorded in 2020. Large twin spot carpet was last recorded in 2004. Royal mantle is not recorded. And there we have an example of a species that wasn't recorded in the Tetrad at all. I'll now turn that off. Right. Um, so I think I've covered almost all the species. The final thing is something, again, relatively recent addition, the species density map. Um, you can limit that to instead of showing how many species were recorded in each square throughout the whole year during your chosen period of years to record, you can record it, you can let it show um, the total number of species recorded um, during one period of um, a third of a month. And it's saying early January because it's early January at the moment, whichever time of year it is, it will show you that as the default. But it's a drop down box again. So you there are 36 periods to choose from. You don't have to be just seeing the current period. And you can have any sort of record or you can limit to adult records only. Or you can limit to early stage records only or larval feeding sign records or just any any type of record um, so i'll go back to the species density map and then click on the limit species density map box and as you'll see the box has changed and i think if i scroll the years period shown it will change the map yes so it's taking note of that and if i click on macros or micros yes it's taking note of that as well i think if i click on rare and scarce it will 
Yes, no rare or scarce species recorded in early January at all. And um, if I click on, my, on migrants, yes, there are some migrant macros recorded in early January. Wow, um, that's probably going to be um, silver Y or something like that. Or no, we've got dark sword grass and silver Y, pearly underwing. Oh, no. Ah, oh, these are. Yes, these button clicks where I'm clicking over a tetrad that isn't taking any notice of the um, of this limiting the species density map click um, uh, selection. So um, that's something to use when you're really just interested in the species density map. Um, as I said earlier, there is a phone version. Um, like this version, this will take a little while to load, but again, it only takes a few seconds. So if I click on that, um, that's interesting. It hasn't done anything because I'm sharing my screen with Zoom, I think. Um, I will have to stop sharing this one for a moment and show you the um, show you the phone version on a different tab. So hold on a mo. You should be able to see the phone version. Yeah, got it. Right. OK, so here we have a phone version. Um, you can also use this with a computer, so that's what I'm going to be doing right now. But it's designed for use with a touch screen. And because it's designed for use with a touch screen, it gives you sound feedback if you want it, which is on by default. Um, this symbol in the top right shows that sound is on. If I click on that, that will make the sound to show you that you've clicked on it and it will actually then turn sound off. And it will no longer show sound, make a sound when I click on something, um, unless I click on this to turn sound on again. So I'll just click on that. So you probably heard that. Did you hear it, Steve? Yeah. Yeah. I'll click on it again so you'll hear when I do clicks. Right. So. It's got the same method of selecting species by scientific, common, or food. Um, it works in exactly the same way. If I put the mouse over, over the, the um, box to the right where it says three plus characters and start entering a name. Now hit a Zoom problem. If I was if I was doing this on my own screen without sharing it, I could enter text there, but because I'm doing this in Zoom, it won't let me enter any text there. This is a shame. So I can't actually demonstrate this by putting some text in. Um, but if I did enter some text there um, in the box below where it currently says enter more characters, it would tell me how many matches there were. And if I clicked on that box, it would give me a list to choose from on the matches. And then when I checked on something, it would jump down to the top of the map to about there and show me the map for the species. Well, I can't show you that by selecting the species by entering the name, but I can show you by Clicking on these buttons, yes. So you can move one or two species forwards or backwards in the checklist. Um, and you can select the years shown in the same way as on the main maps. 
and you can select whether it's 10 kilometer or the number of years recorded or the year chart for the species. Um, you can see the recent selections. Um, we haven't got a really common species there yet, so I'll go a few more species. That's a good one. Common swift. Years, 10 kilometer, number of years, the chart, back to the map. Um, let's just have the pre 2000 records or the pre 2010 or the pre 2020 or all years. So you've got these same options. Um, you see these buttons here. Oh, hang on. Of course, this is how to do it. Um, you can enter a name this way. Um, so if I enter, um, if I wanted wood tiger, I've just clicked on W, O, O and D space T for tiger. Oh, no matching species because it's I'm on scientific name. So I've got to a common name and it's gone straight to showing the map because that's the only matching species. Why was I thinking earlier that I could use the keyboard? Of course, I can't use the keyboard. Um, so um, you use this keypad to enter the species name. You can res restrict it to scientific or common. You can restrict it to micros or macros. Um, and you can delete the last character. That's the equivalent of backspace. You can clear the whole name. There's something else here, species list. What's that? If I click on that, I hope you can now see a species list um, and a curvy slider bar. Have you, can you see that? Steve? Sorry, I was on mute. Yes, you can see that. Right, OK. Um, so um, there isn't a there isn't an easy way of having a really long slider bar on a phone screen um, without having to zoom in on it, and, and um, I didn't want to do that. So here, without needing to zoom in, is a really long slider bar and bending back on itself. I call it a snake. So when you're using this with a phone, you have to push on it anywhere on your touch screen and it'll jump to wherever you've just pressed. So as you see my cursor moving around, if I click on where the cursor is showing, it will jump to there on the screen. Um, I've actually disabled um, sound output for this. Um, But for all of the other buttons, it was showing, um, it was providing sound output if you selected that option. Um, where I am at the moment is shown at the top of this little list above and also in bigger text just below. Um, if you use this version from a computer, you can drag the slider by sliding the mouse around. And you can jump between the um, curves by sliding the pointer up and down. And it will jump to the nearest point on a curve. Um, the background, the colored background and the vertical black bars, those are just an indication of different families. And so I change, change the color every now and again. And some of the more significant families have a entire color to themselves. So um, this green family here is the tortoises, which is one of the biggest or the biggest family. Um, and we've got the geometrids is a big family and the noctuids is a big family. 
and some of the other families are quite big and some of them are so tiny that you'd, you wouldn't even see them if they had their own colour because the black bars are so close to each other. Anyway, so you can use that as a way of selecting species. Um, so you might just be interested in seeing pugs. And one way of doing that is to enter pug. and find the common, go to one, go to the first matching pug name. Now look at the species list. And now you've got this list of pugs is available from the drop down box, all 47 of them. Or if you go to the species list instead, Ah, dentated pug is separated from all of the others. That's an interesting point. Um, the other species. Yeah, 70.129, 70.141, the first of the, of the pugs we know and love so much and hate for the difficulty of identification is 70.141. So if I go to that one and then go to the species list, Right, and now we're at the start of the pugs and by clicking on these plus eight or, or more, we can work our way down through the pugs list and select on whichever pug we want to see, click on it. Uh, just seen Wormwood pug and that's now moved to the top and the pointer has moved to where we are in the list and you can drag the pointer backwards and forwards and see the different pugs. Oh, look at narrow winged pug. Click on that and there we are. So you can use this in the field if you've got a phone signal. So when you're out recording, you can see if you found something new and you can look at the verification requirement because the typical UK larval food and the verification comments, if there are any, are given in the box below the map. Um, I can provide a version of this that actually has all of the data built into it, so you don't even need a phone signal to use it. But you do need to then store it in your phone's internal memory and you need to set up a link to it in your phone browser in its um, bookmarks um, or um, some other way of finding an easy, fast way to it. Um, and for anyone who's never done this before, it can be very difficult to do. It isn't well documented on the web. Um, um, I've done it on two different Android phones and it was done a different way on the two phones because they were different versions of Android. So um, it's not straightforward at all. It's how I use the maps out in the field because my phone is pay as you go and I don't see any reason why I should pay to use my own maps um, through fetching them off over the web every time. <laughs>